Man, good to see you guys. Uh, especially, um, I, I, Kim and I haven't been here in the past couple of weeks. Give a round of applause to the two pastors, Pastor Glenn and Pastor Kenny, who spoke over the past two Sundays. And, uh, you know, we've been in a series, a series called Here's Hope. And uh, I appreciate them carrying on through that series. Today, we actually wrap that series up after being in that series for two, two months. So that's really cool that we're going to wrap that up today. Um, here it is. Here it is. I'm just going to come right out and tell you what it's all about. Today, it's called Here's Hope When You're Down. Anybody in here ever down? None of you? Just, okay. No, you know. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning is that all of us find ourselves at this place. Uh, here's a place where we can be real with one another. And my prayer is that we are going to be real today, real as we come before the Lord and ask that he will begin to work and move through us, showing us exactly what he would have us to do. So that being said, get your pens, your Bibles, your notes. I really do hope to get you out a little quick today, all right? So we'll do that. And uh, no promises, no promises. But let's begin with a word of prayer, okay? Heavenly Father, thank you so very much that you are a God who is very near to us, even at those times when it doesn't seem like it, that we can know that you will never leave us or forsake us. That's your promise. Father, this morning, I ask that your spirit will direct our minds, guide our hearts, in the way that you would have us to go, especially when we find ourselves defeated, down, distressed, depressed, with nowhere to go. We thank you that you love us in such a way that you will do that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In just a little while, somebody's going to ask a question. It's a four-word question. And 70,000 people will respond the same way to that question. The question will be asked by Samuel L. Jackson. And the question is this. He will ask at Mercedes-Benz Stadium, what do Falcons do? And 70,000 people will stand up and say, Falcons rise up. And we'll all get excited. We'll all get inspired. I want to ask you a question today, though. A similar question. But how you respond, well, it shows perhaps where you're at. What do you do? What do you do? When you find yourself, and I didn't say if, I said when. When you find yourself down. When you find yourself defeated, when you find yourself, it might be all on depression. When you find yourself feeling like there's no way out, there is no hope, what do you do? What's your go-to? Today, we're going to find out what God's Word says to do. What God's Word shows us to do regarding what we do when we find ourselves at that place. God's Word is faithful. And you can look all through God's Word, Scripture here, showing us person after person who has been depressed, who has been at that place, who has been perhaps maybe where you are even now. Two Fridays ago, Kim and I began our anniversary celebration. 25 years. Yeah, how about that, huh? And so we wanted to do it up right, do it up big, and we got this whole trip that we planned out, and, and it began when we touched down in Seattle two Fridays ago. We flew out to Seattle, and the plane landed, and as you guys know, as the plane lands and it begins to taxi to the gateway, that's when everybody pulls out their cell phones and flips them back on, right? And so that began to happen. My wife included pulls out her cell phone and, and takes it off air, airplane mode. And then suddenly, a message pops up. 
And I watch as she begins to read this message and her mouth drops open. And she says, oh no, oh no, oh no. I said, what is it, what is it? Tell me what it is. She continues just to read and says, oh no, no. I said, tell me, what, what's going on, what's going on? And that's when she says that her childhood best friend just lost her only son to suicide. And this whole last week, we're asking those questions. Why? Why? What, 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 what causes that? What, how, can, how can somebody be there? What, what, what should we have done? What should we have seen? What, what, what should we do? Why? And see, I understand that 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 is not foreign probably to any of you. You've been touched perhaps in the same way by somebody. And you ask those same questions. Why? How? What should we have done? What can we do? And I want to be honest with you guys, there are no easy answers. I'm not going to stand up here today and tell you that, that every bit of depression is simply a spiritual issue. Because you're a complex human being. God created you complex. God put a physical body with a spiritual soul. Combine the two. And there are a lot of factors that go into this. Spiritually, spiritual being one of them, but there's also the psychological factor. There's the emotional factor. There's the physiological factor. There's even the social factor, relational factors. There's all these different factors that go into this. And I wish I could say it's a pat, quick, easy answer for anybody, but it's not. But what I do know is that here in God's word, we can find hope. Here in God's word, we see people struggle in the same way, and it's here in God's word that we see what God would have us to do during these times that are, that are so very difficult. I'm also aware that in a crowd this size, that there's somebody here today who feels like, I don't know which way to go. I don't know what to, what to do. I don't have any hope. I don't, I'm just living in despair after despair after despair. And I find myself terribly depressed. And not only on top of that, you probably feel guilty or you're even feeling that way. But today I want to say there is hope. There is hope. And if you will, with me, let's look to God's word. Let's ask those questions. Let's see what we can find in this psalm and this truth that God has given to us so that we can, we can once again rejoice and celebrate. Psalms 42 is the psalm I want to introduce you to. And the reason is because the one who wrote this psalm, and most theologians believe it was David, it has David's uh, imprint all over it, but he's called the psalmist in this one. And as you look at this psalm, you're going to see that here's somebody who gets it. Here's somebody who understands what you're going through. Here's somebody who has been there. As you read through the psalms, you're going to see that over and over, David is so up and down. That there are incredible lows in his life. But at the same time, there's something that he commits himself to doing at those times. Today, we're going to talk about the spiritual aspect of it as we read through Psalms 42. As I read through this, though, I want you to see, perhaps, if you're going through the very same things that maybe David or feelings that David had in this psalm. This is a psalm that he gives, it says, to the choir director. Some of you will read that at the top of your outline there. 
And I think the reason he does this is because it's a psalm that he says people need to know this. They need to have this. They need to memorize this. They need to review. They need to be here at this place so they too will do these very things. Psalms 42, starting in verse 1. As the deer pants for the water brooks, he says, so my soul pants for you. Oh God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. In other words, where are you, God? Where are you? When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night. While they continually say to me, where is your God? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul within me. For I used to go with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with a voice of joy and praise with a multitude that kept a pilgrim's feast. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. Oh my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, from the heights of Hermon, from the hill. Miser, deep calls unto deep with the noise of your waterfalls. All your waves and billows have gone over me. The Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, and in the night his song shall be with me. A prayer to the God of my life. I will say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go on mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a breaking of my bones, my enemies reproach me while they say to me all day long, where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God. For I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. And you can kind of feel what David's going through and kind of see where he's at, the struggle that he has. And I want to ask again, what do you do? What do you do when that's how you feel? What do you do when you're deep in depression? And you see no way out. What do you do? You know, one of the amazing things about God's word is, yes, it's filled with truth, but not just that. One of the amazing things about God's word is his word teaches us how to think. And it shows us how to think. It shows us how to direct and guide our minds. It shows us how our minds can be transformed. It says in Romans chapter 12 that we are transformed by the renewing of our minds. And in the same way as we read through God's word, and we even see a psalm like this, and what David does, it shows us what we should do, where we should go, how we should act, what we should do when we find ourselves at a place like that. I want to pause again and pray. And I want to pray for each person in here specifically. And if there's somebody you know that's struggling in that same way, I want you right now to pray for that person specifically. Heavenly Father, we, we can't hide our hearts from you. You know us better than even we know ourselves. And Father, my prayer right now is for that person that you know that is hurting, that is struggling, that is battling. Father, that you would, by your spirit, guide their mind, their thoughts, that they would be lifted, that they would see you again, and that they could rejoice. Set them free. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to give you this morning, just real fast, what I call the psalmist's guide for dealing with depression. 
And what you see is this played out in the psalm that we just read, as well as in other psalms and other places throughout Scripture, Lamentations being one of those. But so we call the psalmist guide for dealing with depression. And so several things to write down real quick. One of the first things that we see the psalmist do is, is and I'll write this down, number one, is to tell God how you feel. Tell God how you feel. We go back to the very beginning of this psalm, and he's talking about deer here. How strange. He's talking about drinking water. But I think you see, and I think you get the metaphor of the feelings that he's having. He goes, as the deer pants for water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. What is he saying? He's saying, where are you, God? Have you abandoned me? Have you forgotten about me? He even goes on to say, you know, there was a time when I'd go up and I'd, I, with everybody, I'd go to church and we'd be praising God and it was great and, and it was exciting, but, but it's like you, you've just disappeared on me. You ever felt that way? Do you see what he's doing? He's coming clean. He's being real. He's telling God exactly how it is that he feels. And I, I say that as if it's something that, do you, do you realize, one of the things that drives me crazy is, is people who try to act holier than the Holy Bible. Do you know what I mean by that? And I think one of the ways sometimes we try to act holy is to pretend that, that we, we never struggle. To pretend we never have pain or we never have hurts. To pretend that, that uh, we, we, we act like, well, a good Christian should never, never be depressed. A good Christian should always have a big smile on their face. Uh, a good Christian, they, and, and how silly that is because what we find in God's Word is just the opposite. All through God's Word we find holy men and women of God who, who, who just come right out and say, I'm struggling. I'm hurting. I don't know what to do. Elijah, you know the story of Elijah, don't you? Remember, remember Elijah? And here he had a really big day. It was like, kind of like having a big Sunday, you know, where, where God did great things, and it was absolutely amazing where he defeated the prophets of Baal on this mountain, and everybody saw it, and it was just, wow, incredible. And what happens the next day? He's running out to the wilderness, scared frightened, afraid, terrified, and he gets out to the middle of the wilderness, and, and, and it's there he just kind of lays down and says, God, just take my life. Take my life. I give up. I can't handle it anymore. And you see him so depressed. Depressed. And that's Elijah, the prophet of God. Not only that, this scripture right here, 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 15, uh, the woman saying this, her name is Hannah, and she is being harassed and kind of ridiculed over and over because she is not able to have a child. And, and what, what does she do? She actually goes to church. She goes to the temple. It'd be like somebody coming in here and just, just wailing out loud and crying out loud in distress, and so much so that the priest walks over and says, what is wrong with you, lady? And her response is, I am very discouraged, and I was pouring out my heart to the Lord. There's another prophet. His name's Jeremiah. He wrote a whole book of the Bible called Lamentations. Now, here's the thing about the book of Lamentations. If you weren't depressed before you read it, you will be after you read it, okay? <laughs> I mean, you look at this, and it's like, can it get any worse? I mean, this guy has been through it, and that's the whole book except for just a few small verses smack dab in the middle of the book that, that do just what we're talking about right here, that David does. And over and over we see this, David, all throughout the Psalms, up, down, up, down, incredibly discouraged at times, defeated, depressed. When I was a kid, Little tiny kid. Um, you're going to think this is weird, uh, and it is kind of, okay? Um, when I was a little kid, I did something. I think my mom thought it was weird, too. But I would go to my mom, and uh, I, I would say to mom, hey, mom, pretend I'm another kid. And she would go, okay. And so I'd go outside, and then I'd knock on our front door. 
And she would come, and she'd open up the door, and she goes, hi, what's your name? And I'd come up with some name of somebody else. And then I would say, uh, is Bo here? Can he come out and play? And she would go, sure, he's here. And she'd turn around and call me, or call fake Bo. <laughs> and fake Bo would come to the door, imaginary Bo, and I'd be like, hey, let's go out and play, man. And, and we'd, we'd take off, and we'd have a great time the rest of the day. Me and fake Bo. <laughs> now, I did that, and, and some of you are going, that's disturbing, you know, but uh, <laughs> as a kid. But, but, but here's the thing. I think so many of us as adults still do the very same thing. We grow up, and the only person that we put out there is fake Bo. Fake you. We try to pretend we're another kid. We pretend we're another father who doesn't never struggle. We pretend we're another husband who never, never is going to show that he can't handle things. Or how about this? We pretend we're another pastor. Oh, how I would love for you to pretend with me, pretend that, uh, that I'm super pastor. You know, you know, super pastor, that's Pastor Bo. Super pastor is one that, uh, you know what, he can, uh, he can counsel hundreds of people without feeling down in a single bound. Or he can, he can take insult and, and criticism and just kind of bounces right off of them and never gets down and discouraged about it. Or he can have stress from, from the last week or the last Sunday and just pop back right up and soar through the air like super pastor. But if for a second I could take off my cape, you would see what, what my wife of 25 years has been able to see that nobody else sees. Those Mondays where after a great day on Sunday, I'm ready to quit. <laughs> where she talks me down. Those days where the stress has gotten to me and I break down in an embarrassing way in front of my wife. Those, those uh, days where you feel like there's nobody. You don't have a friend. Uh, do, do you see? Do you see? Uh, how can we expect a, 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 a church to be a safe place if the pastor can't be safe? To say, this is real, though. And now what is real you? What is real you? And can you be real enough, not to every, not just everybody else, but can you be real enough to God to come before him and pour yourself out? Hey, hey, you, you know what? God won't be surprised by your feelings. God's feelings won't get hurt by your feelings. In fact, you know this? God already knows how you feel. He knows what you're going through. But it's that moment where you come and you pour yourself out before God and say, this is what I'm dealing with and this is how I feel. And I know maybe I shouldn't, but this is how I feel. And it's in those moments that God is drawing you ever closer to himself. And that's, that's the first part. That's what, that's what the psalmist does. He just pours himself out before the Lord. So I ask the question again, what do you do? What do you do? The psalmist, first of all, he told us to tell God how you feel. The second thing he tells us, number two, is to search for the source of your pain. Search for the source of your pain. 
uh, do you notice he asked the question, it's kind of a weird thing what he's doing right here. He asked the question, why are you cast down, O my soul? Do you see what he's doing there? He's talking to himself. He's talking to his soul. He says, why are you cast down? If I were to say to you, where there's smoke, you would say, yeah, it's kind of get one with the other, right? In a, in, in, in a similar sort of way, where there are emotions, where there is maybe depression, where there is despair, you can always follow it back to the source. And it's a good thing for you to do just that. That's what he's saying. Why am I cast down? What's the source of this? What's causing this in my life? Where is this coming from? And David, in another psalm, what does he write? He says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the paths of everlasting life. And what he's saying right there is there are things that happen. There, there are things that go on in my life. And oftentimes I'm not even aware of these things that are causing how I feel and how I act and these emotions in my life. But God, show these things to me. Show me where it's coming from. He even asked the question, is there some sin in my life that is unconfessed? Is there something that I'm doing that I know I shouldn't be doing that is displeasing to you that can cause this in my life? Then show me what it is in the same way. There are a lot of different things, a lot of different things that come into play here. What is the source? Where is it coming from? With Elijah, do you remember the story? Do you remember what happened? He goes out there to the desert, and he's there before God, and he, he's saying, God, uh, take my life. Take my life. I'm done. I can't do this anymore. Completely discouraged, completely depressed. And what is the first thing that God does? What is the first thing that God gives to him? Rest. Sleep. Lets them sleep. Wakes them up after a little while, feeds them, and then lets them sleep some more. Feeds them. Do you see what he's doing? He's taking care of his physical body as well. And it can be a physical source that can cause this, but we have to follow that source. We have to figure out what it is. By the way, that's where doctors can do incredible things for you if, if you are. It, it could be trying to find out where that source is and what that is coming from. But I would challenge you, search for the source of your pain. Let me ask you this. How many of you uh, ever get mad when you're hungry? Yeah, we call it hangry, right? You ever get hangry? I do, um, and big time, not only do I, but my entire family does, and so we literally get to be very dangerous, dangerous people if we don't eat at the right time. But uh, that's one of the things, there, there are times when we're, we're, we're just battling in our house, and our household, and I can't believe you just said that to me, you said that to me, and we're just angry, whoa, 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 wait, there's some smoke, what's the source? Where's this really coming from, you see? Or how about this, how many of you, uh, stress can do it for you, you know? And it caused you to say things that you wouldn't normally say. It caused you to feel things. A lot of you don't know. I, it could be sunshine. How many of you, I, I'm solar powered, okay? <laughs> yeah, and if it's gloomy, uh, I, notice, I notice that affects even how I feel at times. But there are so many different other things that come into play here. Being tired, being exhausted. It could be loneliness. It could be a relationship that, that's been bothering you. You don't even realize that it's bothering you. There's, there's been a, come, comes from a broken relationship. What is the source? Where is it coming from? Years ago, I'll tell you this right quick. Years ago, um, Kim and I were, uh, uh, it was in the middle of the week. We had a big event here at church. I can't remember exactly what it was. But uh, we were on our way to this event uh, we hopped into the car and we hit traffic. We hit bad traffic and it was right and it was making us late. We were going to be very late, but it was just bumper to bumper traffic that we didn't account for. Here it is. The pastor is going to be late to church. OK. And, and, and so I'm driving. I'm getting very frustrated. I'm getting, I'm just seeing it happen. I'm starting to get angrier. Anybody else like that? Anybody? Just me? Okay. I'm getting angrier and angrier. And, and, and then it happens. We get to this one intersection. You know how these intersections go. We're, uh, we're going, and, and there's, a, there's one after another. There's cars that are trying to, trying to push their way in from the right over here, trying to, trying, to, trying to merge in. You know that kind of merge thing? 
And, uh, and so the thing to do is everybody's kind of doing it, and the nice people are like, yeah, yeah, come in, and they'll let a car in, and they'll go, and then, then another car tries to push in, and yeah, yeah, come in, and let another car, and that's kind of the way it's playing out, okay? Well, I get to that same intersection, and there I am, and I do the nice thing. I do the kind thing. I go, yeah, yeah, come on in, and I let one car go, but then, <laughs> then there's that person who wants me to let two cars in. Another guy trying to push his way in. You, you know that, that just kind of ease up and keep easing up, trying to just kind of, and I'm like, uh-uh, uh-uh. <laughs> I already let my car in. Uh-uh, uh-uh. And so I'm, I'm going forward, I'm going forward, and I'm pushing, I'm pushing up, and the whole time I'm just getting, uh-uh, no, getting mad, getting mad and pushing up. And, 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 you know, when you're doing that kind of thing, you act like you don't see them, right? You kind of. And so I'm, I'm playing that and just keep on easing up. Man, we're getting closer and closer. He's still over there pushing his way up and butting his way. I can't believe he's going to do this. I can't believe he's going to do this. And, and, and I'm sorry, okay, I've realized, okay, i got to look at him now. i got to look at him now. But when I look at him, I'm going to give him the look. <laughs> I'm going to give him the look. He's going to know I'm not happy about this. I'm going to give him the look. That's what I'm going to do. And so, so after a little while, I kind of go, And when I turn to look, suddenly I see the face of this jerk <laughs> with a big old smile, laughing his head off. It was Mario Arnold who sings up here. <laughs> we were saying that. That's your jerk right there, okay? <laughs> I think it's somewhere in the Bible that you shouldn't do that to pastors, you know? It's like, I don't know. Man. But, but, but it's funny because it's times like this that you kind of stop and have a look at yourself and go, wow, wow. Look what gets me going. Look what sets me off. Look what that source is that bothers me. And it's good to be able to come to the Lord and say, okay, what is it? God, show me. Show me. Show me what is not right. Show me what's not good. Show me what's causing these emotions that I, I battle each and every day. So we search for the source of your pain. Number three, the psalmist guide to dealing with depression. Number three, command your soul. And I'm going to give you four things real quick to do in this. Command your soul. Remember, uh, you guys know that so many of us, we learned growing up, uh, listen to your heart, right? How many of you heard that phrase before? Listen to your heart. There's even, remember, there's an 80s song that was, uh, listen to your heart. Remember that one? Yeah. And we kind of learned that. And it was, we kind of went with this idea. We're supposed to be going through life just listening to our heart. Wherever our heart leads us, that's where we go. Instead of listening to your heart, I want to challenge you to speak to your heart. Speak to your soul. Don't follow your heart. Speak to your heart. Command your soul. That's what he does right here. We see all throughout where he says, ah, why am I cast down? Why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, soul. Hope in God, soul, for I shall yet praise him. So I want to challenge you in this. Number three, command your soul. Number one, first, to thank God for past blessings. Thank God for past blessings, and that's exactly what he does. He says, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, from the heights of Hermon, from the hill Mizar. What is he doing? He's saying, wait a second, this is how I feel, and I'm completely distressed, I'm discouraged, I'm down, I'm depressed, but wait a second, soul. I am gonna, I'm going to remember. I'm going to remember the blessings of God. I'm going to remember when, he, when, I, when I thought all hope was lost and he did this in my life. I'm going to look at this and I'm going to focus on this. I'm going to see how he's blessed me here and he's blessed me here. Do you guys know? Do you guys know? That psychologists have proven that it is physiologically impossible to be depressed and thankful at the same time. And so that's what he's doing. He's saying, I am going to thank God. I'm going to thank God through this. Number two, command your soul then to believe the truth and reject the lies. To believe the truth 
and reject the lies. You see all throughout where he says, but wait a second, I know you, God. I know the truth of you. I know who you are, and I know what your word says about you. Not only do I know who you are, I know who I am in you and what your word says about me, the truth about me. Do you know who your number one influencer is? Yourself. Because you talk to yourself more than you talk to anybody else. Have you ever thought about what you say to yourself? You ever thought about how it is that you talk to yourself? How many of you, real quick, how many of you have a southern accent? Okay. How'd you get that? Yeah, exactly. Your mama. Your mama taught you that. You learned that. How many of you have a northern accent? Yeah. How'd you get it? You learned it growing up. I mean, if, if, if any of you who kind of, I'm going to start talking southern now, and that's what, you're weird, okay? Um, <laughs> No, but that's something you get naturally. That's something you just learn, that accent. Do you know in the same way you might learn an accent naturally regarding how you talk to yourself? Some of us, well, we grew up in a household where there was a lot of negative talk all the time. There's a lot of defeating talk all the time. There's a lot of cutting remarks made by parents. And so you learn that accent. And so even now, when you talk to yourself, your accent is basically, you can never do it. You're no good. With that same accent. And you begin to believe those very lies that you tell yourself day in and day out. But what if, what if instead you take the truth, the truth from God's word and what God's word says about you, and you change that accent. You begin to speak the words, what God says about you, from here, the truth, into your own life. We just sang a song, I'm a child of God. What if you begin to to speak those words, that truth, into your life, that you are that child of God, that child of God that he loves so very dearly. And you, do you see? Do you see? Speak the truth. And reject the lies. Command your soul, number three, not to close up, but to reach out. Not to close up, but to reach out. The first response for so many of us, the natural response, is when we're down, we're depressed, we're discouraged, just close up the house. Don't answer the phone. Close the drapes. More specifically, close yourself. Off from anybody and anything, because you certainly don't want anybody knowing that. Or, but don't close up. Instead, reach out. Find that person, that friend who is out there, that friend who can encourage you, that friend who will come alongside you, that friend who will speak words of life into your life. Maybe it's through a small group. If you're not in a small group, get plugged into one. Maybe find somebody. Reach out. But don't just reach out for a friend. I want to. I want to challenge you this way also. <clears throat> Reach out and help somebody else. Reach out and serve somebody else. How many of you went on vacation this last week? Everybody's still on vacation. Who uh, um, <laughs> did go? Um, anybody go to Disney World? In Disney World? Yeah. You know they say that's the happiest place on earth. Um, you know it's a lie, right? Yeah. It's. They say that. They say happiest place on earth, Disney World. But I got to tell you guys, man, I've stood in three-hour long lines in the blazing heat with kids screaming, it's not the happiest place. (laughs) But let me tell you this. You know what is the happiest place on earth? Happiest place on earth is the soul of the person who sacrificially serves somebody in need. That's when you see it. That's when you see it. The people who begin to focus on others, who serve other people. I, I got to tell you guys, sitting out here over, over the last few days, people driving up, uh, taking water out of their car, big smiles on their faces because what are they doing? For a moment, they quit focusing just on themselves and they focused on somebody else who was in need and they stepped up and they served and they're thrilled. They're thrilled. There's a joy that is natural that comes from that. So reach out and serve. And then number four, command your soul to praise God in everything. Command your soul to praise God in everything. 
in whatever situation you find yourself in, in whatever circumstance, in whatever mood, determined to praise God anyway. Praise God anyway. Psalms 42, 11, that's what he does. He says, I will put my hope in God. I will praise him again, my Savior and my God. Years ago, I went to get on a flight. It was going to be a long flight. I had to go speak in Brazil. And a lot of you know this, that I'm not too fond of flying. Um, I'm not very relaxed when I fly. I'm a little nervous. I'm the nervous flyer. Um, I've told you guys this before. I don't like the taking off part or the landing part or anything in between that, okay? <laughs> um, and, uh, and so my mind just kind of races. It goes all sorts of places. When, when they take that big old plane up in the air, I'm like, is this, how is this thing staying up? I mean, is it going to stay up? You know, there are wrecks. Um, you know, we're a long ways up. Uh, and, and every little noise, I'm like, what was that? What was that? Uh-oh, what was that? Well, on this particular flight, it was going to be like 11, uh, 12 hours long. It's one of those where they want you to sleep on the flight. It goes all night long. And uh, so it was a long flight. And so there I am. I'm sitting in my little chair, and uh, they, they feed us, and then they turn out the lights. They give you one of those little blankets, one of those little tiny pillows. And I'm sitting there, and I'm like, okay, okay, maybe I can get some rest. Maybe I can go to sleep. But then the turbulence. The turbulence happens, and that plane starts bouncing and bumping all night long. I feel like we're going on a roller coaster, going up and down, and it's shaking. And I look around, and there are people sleeping. <laughs> and I'm angry because I can't. How in the world? But they're sleeping on this flight, and here I am, and I'm just holding on for everything that I got. And the whole flight... I remember we landed there in Rio de Janeiro, and I'm just worn out, tired from being stressed out, not having slept the whole night. And we land, and we're pulling up to the gate, and that's when the pilot comes on the intercom. He says, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is your captain speaking. I just want to welcome you to Rio de Janeiro. Uh, my name is Captain Adams. And I said, well, that's kind of weird. Uh, captain's got the same last name as me. And then it hit me, whoa, you know what? I have a cousin who's a pilot for Delta. <laughs> and sure enough, we're getting off the plane, and there he stands, big smile on his face. He goes, hey! And I said, oh, my goodness, why can't you fly better? And uh, <laughs> I didn't know it was you, man. I didn't know it was you. And I got off that flight, and I thought to myself, wow. Wow. Here I am, stressed out the whole time, and I knew the pilot the whole way. You, you see, I think so many of us, we're going to get to the end of this life, and we're going to look back over this life that we've been given, and we're going to see, well, I was so worried, and I was so stressed out, and I lost so much sleep, and I was depressed at this time, and I was so down, and I was so upset. And, and we get to the end, and we go, <laughs> I knew the pilot the whole time. I knew the one who was in control the whole time. I could, have, I could have celebrated. I could have rejoiced each and every moment back then, trusting him every step of the way. I could have celebrated because I knew the pilot, and he was with me the whole time. Friend, I want you to realize that. No matter where you're at, no matter what you're going through, Start praising him now. Start celebrating now. Start thanking him now. Praise him for who he is and what you know about him now. You can celebrate no matter where it is that you're at. Praise the Lord because you know the one who's in control. You know the pilot. Let's bow in a word of prayer. I said you know the one who's in control, but let me ask, do you know the one who's in control? Do you know Jesus as your Savior? Have you put your faith and trust in him for eternal life? If you haven't, friend, here now, call out to him. Say, Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sin and be my God and my Savior, my friend. Friend, when you pray a prayer like that, you mean it with your heart. The Bible says you can know in that moment you become a child of God. You have an eternity in heaven waiting for you. You know the one who's in control. 
Father, I thank you for those who prayed that prayer. Father, I ask that we would all just see that and we would know that, we would realize that no matter where we're at and what situation we find ourselves in, to know that there is hope, there is hope in you and that we can rejoice here and now based on your goodness that you love us. Father, we pray this for ourselves and we pray this for our, those friends, family members who are struggling in the same way that they too will find their hope in you. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.